You're listening to the Savannah Institute's Pioneer Agroforestry Farm Tour Series. This audio recording features Harry Hoke of Hoke Orchard in southeast Minnesota and was produced by Man Alone Media with support from the North Central SARE program. Be sure to check out the Pioneer Agroforestry Farm Tour video series at savannahinstitute.org. I'm Harry Hoke. I'm the co-owner of Hoke Orchards and Gardens with my wife Jackie. We have about a 95 acre farm here, um, all on a ridge top. We've got about 60 acres of land that is not in steep hillside and woodlands. And we have a very diversified perennial fruit operation. We're standing here in, in block one, which is my main block of disease resistant apple cultivars. And these varieties require minimal amounts of uh, fungicides. So the variety that's right here is Sansa, which is a very nice summer apple. Uh, we'll be harvesting them in the next week. Um, one thing that we've done on this farm over the years is, is try lots of different apple varieties, both conventional and disease resistant. And we have a big selection of 50 to 100 different varieties, and most of them being table varieties, some being hard cider varieties. But what we do is we utilize this in our marketing so we can always have two or three varieties on the shelf available to the stores. And that gives us more shelf space in the co-ops and the health food stores that carry our local organic apples. And then with having all of these varieties ripening over, ripening over a long season, it helps in the marketing and the product placement. So as far as scope and scale of our orchard, we only are producing about 20 acres of uh, dessert quality fruit, but we produce a few thousand bushels of first quality, first and second quality fruit that we can market, and then we market that to stores all over Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. Uh, we use a, a uh, distribution company called Co-op Partners Warehouse, and they focus on servicing food co-ops in the upper Midwest. So our orchard is, is just big enough that we can use a distributor and we have enough varieties over a long period of time that we can have our brand on the shelves. A lot of small orchards have problems because they, they can't stay marketing, they can't compete with us or they can't compete with the western apples uh, that are coming in. So it's hard for a store to take in a variety from one company, one little truckload of them, and then that runs out and then they have to wait for the next one to come in. And it's also more difficult if they only have one variety. So if you're an orchard with two or three varieties and one is a summer apple and two are mid-season, one or two are late, it's a lot more difficult to keep shelf space and sell using the system that we sell, that we use. So it uh, took a long time to develop all this. Uh, but we have a pretty, a pretty good amount of apples that go to, to market. Uh, but since we are organic, there's always damage on the apples. Uh, we vary from 80% packable fruit down to 20 or 30. Uh, and it can vary within a block, and it can vary from block to block. And with all this processing fruit, uh, a few thousand bushels of it, we have to utilize that, and we can't just sell this low quality fruit onto the conventional market for processing because we only get a couple dollars a bushel. Um, so we put in uh, a commercial kitchen and an a apple juice facility so we can utilize these uh, lower quality apples. Uh, so we're able to utilize the majority of the crop. There's always some apples though that fall on the ground and some that are damaged to the point that they can't be processed and to use those, we've decided to add animals into the system. And when we were thinking about animals and trying poultry, started reading more about the soil, the interaction of animals in the environment, and just started to learn about how the animals are the link between the cycling of the nutrients. And when you think about it, there is no natural system without animals. So when farmers are trying to produce on a vegetable farm or a tree farm and there's no animals in the system, it's really not a balanced ecology. 
So what we're trying to do here is figure out rotational systems and use several different species of animals, including some ruminants, and having them do some of the mowing. They can clean up the apples post-harvest. They can do grazing, and the pigs will do a little bit of cultivating under the trees in the spring. And with a big, uh, uh, a big range of harvest, we can move animals in post-harvest, starting in August, but only under the, the, the blocks that have uh, early apples in them. And we also have several other fruit rather than just apples. So in order to equal out our, our market presence and the utilization of labor, we're growing some small fruits. So we have strawberries. We've just planted some honeyberries. We have a lot of raspberries, grapes, um, tart cherries, plums, and apricots. So on this farm, we can start harvesting in June and bring in labor and have workers here most of the season, as opposed to trying to find a whole bunch of workers for just a few weeks at the end of the season. So not only do, have we developed kind of a, a balanced ecology, we also have kind of a family or community on the farm. And all, almost all of the workers live on the farm, including the, the supervisors. So uh, our little farm and community here is producing a lot of pounds of fruit for, unfortunately, most of it goes up to the Twin Cities. Not a lot is sold locally, and we don't have the ability to self-distribute. So um, we use, usually take six, eight pallets of fruit up a week. Um, in the fruit in the apple harvest season up to the Twin Cities and then it gets distributed out from there. Although I guess one product that I didn't mention is our hard cider. We've started to make uh, alcoholic apple juice on the farm and sell that under the brand of Hoke Orchard Hard Cider and uh, now we've converted a lot of our a lot of our orchards to just production for apple juice which then is either sold fresh or fermented. So while we have 20 acres of production that is focused on just fresh fruit, we have another 25 to 30 acres that are grown specifically for apple juice. And we don't have to use as many chemicals, we don't have to treat as often in order to just get a, um, a processing grade fruit. But the, uh, the apple cider is a year-round business. Uh, we're hoping to move more of our production to that and, and be more of a cider company with the little with some fresh fruit sold as opposed to a fresh fruit company that's totally dependent on the weather and the quality of the fruit every year and, uh, and be able to use our value added cider and sell that over a year and a half. So you have an, an overlap that way. So if you have a down season, you probably won't notice it so much if you're, if you're selling apple juice that's able to be sold for a year and a half as opposed to fresh apples, which you just have a few weeks or a few months to sell. Okay, on this farm, we're, uh, we're on a pretty high elevation, three to 400 feet above the bottom of the valleys on, on each side of us. And we have a lot of wind up here. Uh, not right now in the heat this evening, but overall there's a constant wind blowing here. And apple trees and, and fruit are very susceptible to wind damage, whether it's the storms that come occasionally and the wind breaks slow down the severity of the storms to the constant winds that are blowing off fruit and banging apples together and, and blowing ripe fruit off the trees before you can harvest it. And then of course there's the, there's the aspect of spraying insecticides and fungicides. And if the winds are blowing we can't get good coverage on the orchards so the wind breaks really slow down the winds a lot and help us get better spray coverage using less pesticides. Uh, this 50 acre, 60 acre section on top of the ridge here, we have wind breaks on both the north and the south side and then some running up and downhill. And that breaks the orchards, this main farm, into about 15 different blocks of fruit, ranging from two to about five acres each. And a, a new project that we started a couple years ago is, is putting uh, multi-species fencing at the base of all of the windbreaks 
So we're turning all of the orchard blocks into paddocks for rotational grazing. And we've got all the fencing in, but we still need to finish the gates and close off a few blocks in order to make our rotational grazing more efficient. So printing of fruit production and anything in permaculture is a long, a long term investment. And with apple trees, even using dwarf varieties, uh, we, can, we can get fruit into production at year three to four, but they're not in full production until almost year 10. So that's, that's a pretty good investment of time. Um, I'm second generation on this farm and I've been testing varieties for a long time and I know it does well on this farm, but uh, if you're going to be good at, at this, you know, you're, you're best to take over another orchard and, and learn from a previous owner or, or continue, a, continue in a family because it really should be a multi-generational business. Uh, being in your early 50s and starting an orchard from scratch and going to a couple of uh, conferences and reading some books, no matter how smart you are, you're not going to be the best apple grower that there is. A lifetime of experience is extremely valuable. Uh, and in, in decades, you know, you'll have, have bad years that you have to overcome things. And in our situation, we've been testing a lot of different types of fruits, uh, pushing the, uh, the hardiness zones by quite a bit. Uh, but um, we've, we've found a nice selection of fruit that gives us a good balance, both for the marketing and the labor side of things. Um, but we've had many, many crops fail, many perennial crops fail. And um, when you look at a perennial fruit crop, whether it's an apple tree, a raspberry bush, a blackberry, a cultivar of strawberries, you, you have to look at the economic feasibility of it because if it isn't making enough fruit or enough high quality fruit to pay for the cost of producing it, then it's reducing the income from the other fruits. You're subsidizing it. So we are pretty quick about removing something if it doesn't work. Okay, well this is high tunnel number one here on the farm. This is a, this is a hay grove high tunnel, also known as being a three season tunnel. So it's fairly inexpensive to build, uh, but it, it's not built heavy enough to support snow in the winter, so we take the skin off in the winter, which has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is it gets all the winter snow, it gets treated like the outside environment for one season out of the year. Uh, right here where we're standing, there's a few vegetables. Most of our tunnels we're using to grow uh, perennial fruits. Um, a few vegetables on this end, we had phased out some different uh, blackberries that didn't work out. Um, and now we just have vegetables in here, some peppers, uh, some cucumbers. And you can see we've got a lot of mulch on the ground. Um, what I want to show, and what, for the big question on, is it really permaculture inside a tunnel? Well, what we're doing in this tunnel here is we're taking advantage of the extra heat and this is the, these are the prima canes of this year's fruit, of this year's canes on raspberries. So I'm only five and a half feet tall, but you can see these canes are close to seven feet tall. Had a wonderful crop of raspberries in here. And we're not using any fertigation in here. We're not even actually fertilizing. We're using compost teas, inoculating the soil. All the prunings go onto the floor of the tunnel and then we mulch over the top. So you can see the raspberry canes are in here and they're breaking down. We put fresh hay that we chop on the farm right over the top of the mulch. If you dig down, you can see this ground is very soft. This isn't like most tunnels that have berries in them and then have fabric or are completely devoid of any, any plants um, other than the main crop. And when we started this tunnel, first we had strawberries in between. So we had raspberries, a row of strawberries, and then in the actual first year, we had vegetables in between that. So this has gone through a progression of little raspberry plants the size of a pencil, 
strawberry plants growing in between, producing a strawberry crop. We even had strawberries and raspberries. But as the raspberries grew up, the strawberries didn't have enough light and they've got phased, gotten phased out. Same with the vegetables. Year one, we were able to grow a lot of vegetables in between all of the raspberry plants. So we're going through a natural progression in here from open ground to mostly annuals to a permanent perennial system. And you can see the fruit, the plants, well you can't see much fruit right now, we're in between the, uh, the primocane fruiting and the, and the floricane fruiting uh, berries. But there are a few, this is uh, fall gold, very sweet, nice raspberry plant. Doesn't grow very well outside in our climate. Uh, has a lot of disease issues, but in in the tunnel we can control how much moisture it has. But you know, nothing on the on the leaves, and then we can control how much by irrigating. And underneath the, each row is uh, irrigation lines, so we can walk ahead and just go right up to the nursery. And as you walk through, you can feel that the ground is soft and squishy. This isn't a hard packed soil. There's worms, there's all kinds of different organisms eating the plants and eating all the organic matter, cycling it through. We'll often bring chickens in in the spring and sometimes in the fall, depending if we keep chickens through the harvest season. I knew it. The cameraman is stuck on a raspberry. <laughs> So this tunnel was originally used to, to test multiple different types of cane berries in here. So we had four black raspberries and two black berries and three or four kinds of red raspberries, both floricane and primocane fruiting, and a couple different purple raspberries. Now the other thing we found out in the tunnels is that trees grow like crazy. So we are growing a lot of nursery stock in here. So these are two year trees. Actually, they might be three-year trees. Um, so these will be dug out and put into the orchards. Generally, we just grow them one or two years, but we did have a problem where the rabbits got past our, all of our fencing and past our dogs and everything and chewed off all the trees in here one year. So the rootstocks have been regrown. But generally, we don't grow them this big in a, in a tunnel. So that's about all we have to show in this tunnel. Okay, this, this set of antiques that we're looking at here. Uh, the main piece here is an old Brady green chopper. I think it's 1960s era. I paid a few hundred dollars for it. It's just a flail mower that blows the choppings up into, into a wagon. And this is what we use to mulch our tunnels and our gardens and cover our strawberries in the fall. And it's a great piece of equipment for, uh, for an organic farm. Uh, instead of buying hay, we, can, we have two options. We can take this out and chop green hay, blow it into the back of this wagon, and then the back I have two doors hinged so we can just open it up and we can fork it off from, from either end. Of course, green chop is really heavy and it heats up and, and starts to, well, it could heat up and burn if you let it set overnight. But it heats up very quickly, so you chop it, you've got to unload it right away, and then what we'll do is put a single layer down in the tunnel. And it's nice because it forms a mat when it dries, but it also doesn't, doesn't decompose anaerobically when you lay it out in a layer right away. And it's, it's wet and heavy, and then it dries into a mat so it isn't blowing all around. The other option is, is we can mow a field first, and then go back and, green, and take the chopper over it, blow a dry or a mix of moist and dry hay into here and then mulch strawberries, tunnels, gardens, whatever. But uh, not a very expensive investment, doesn't get used very often, but when it does, uh, it really, really helps us with our, our mulching. Okay, uh, this facility is extremely versatile. There's a lot of different things that we can do here but we don't do any one thing super efficiently. So wherever we look today, you're gonna to see lots of things going on. So this is our main storage cooler here. So we've just started picking apples for the season. You can see bins, 18 bushel bins of fruit stored in here. 
later on in the season, this will be packed full of fruit, all 18 bushel bins. Right now we have some finished fruit in here. We've got some of the last cider from 2017. You guys probably noticed it smells like wine or cider in here. Just yesterday, Ian was blending our organic uh, Minnesota brute cider. So he still got his pumps and transfer tank right here. Um, but anyway, right now you can see it's being used for multiple things. But this is basically where just the bulk fruit is stored. So this is our, our old packing line. Again, very versatile, old, old technology, uh, but it works really well for, for what we're doing here. We grow many varieties of apples and we have to change over our, our uh, line from one variety to the next quite often. So a big complicated packing line wouldn't work very well when you're packing 50, 75 varieties of apples in a year. But basically the way this line works is right here is a bin dump. So that lifts the 18 bushel, bushel bins up and drops it down onto a table there. Uh, Bruno is taking out some of the lower quality apples and the apples are rolling into the washer there where they're buffed and dried. Then they come out onto that green implement which has inspection rollers on it. And then it drops the apples into an old fashioned spin sizer. So the apples roll around that table and there's different gates of different sizes. So the smallest apples are coming out on the very far bin and they're being graded into the bagger. And then the larger apples come down on this end of the table and they're being graded and stickered and put into a cardboard box. Now one thing that's different on this line than a lot of the big industry is in, the, in most apple industry they do first quality, US number one, extra fancy, and then everything else goes for processing. Here, we're, our packing has to be done with into several different grades, so each person working on the line has to really understand what we're doing and how we're packing. So they're packing number ones with a sticker, number twos go into the wooden box, and then the three, third quality for processing they just sat in a dump in a wooden box and then bring it over here and dump it into the big bin. And this later on will be used uh, for making apple cider or processed into something else. Now our bagger is just an old fashioned weight sizer. And the apples go across that little belt into the tray. It weighs it. There's uh, there's a scale on it. If, it's too many, if there's too many apples, they'll have to take a couple off, not enough, put one in. So it's not completely automated. And then they fill the bag right in that stainless steel tray there. So what I'll show you first here is our first quality apples, the small ones go into an organic apple bag like this, which is a US number one. And then something else that we're doing that most in the industry say you can't do is we take second quality or US number two. So these apples have a few nicks and marks, but they are uh, fully intact apples. They're not bruised or cut, but they're not perfect. They don't fit into the US one, number one grade. So we put these in a red bag. Red usually relates to second place. So second quality. This is a bigger bag, five pounds. So usually the five pound bag is the same price at retail as the three pound number one. So there are a lot of customers, at least in the organic industry and at the food co-ops, that want a second quality apple. Usually in, the, in conventional grocery, you'll never see anything less than an extra fancy. So after the apples are packed up in these boxes, we put them into this cooler. But this cooler is also doubling, tripling, for storage of many different things. We've got berry juice being stored to make apple berry ciders. We've got some sauerkraut fermenting in here. We also have the big tank in the back of the cooler is our carbonation tank. 
So Ian has our Minnesota brute cider that he just blended being carbonated right there. So you can see the CO2 tank that's just sitting there getting bubbly. Uh, when it's finished, we put a pallet jack and roll it out into the kitchen and we bottle it in there. So right now you can see it's mostly cider in here. We have kegged hard cider and 12 ounce bottles of hard cider. You can see some vegetables stored back there and there's some small fermenters. This is kohlrabi being fermented and this is sauerkraut. So multiple things going on at this farm all at the same time. So everything always looks like it's a mess. Okay, this is our animal shed. This is where the animals stay uh, during the winter. And right now they are holed up in here. They have a pen, they can get out into some pasture. But we have so much excess from the kitchen waste and the processing right now that it's just easier to have the animals up here. And they're getting all just waste from the farm, no grain or anything. We had plums and apricots we've been harvesting. Uh, a lot of those go bad really fast, so we grade them out and they come right over here. Here's some apple grade outs. Uh, we've got some processing going on in the kitchen. They're doing cabbage and beans and kohlrabi. There's a box of beans that got too ripe right there. Uh, but anyway, the pigs are getting just a, just a feast constantly. So uh, they're not actually out grazing at this point. The apples are ripening. We don't want them in the orchards right now, right prior to harvest, but they'll go into the orchards after harvest. So these are our two sows. Buddy, come here, pig pig. Come on, buddy. So on our farm, we've been trying several different breeds of pigs. And what I found that I really like is a cross between Gloucestershire Old Spot. So this is the also known as the British Orchard Pig. Very good at gleaning fruit. Uh, 100 years ago, 200 years ago in Great Britain, they would leave these girls out and they would just gain weight and their, their uh, offspring would gain weight just gleaning apples in the orchards and in the woods. Um, so they do really well eating the fruit. And then the other, then we're crossing her, uh, these two, with a, with a mangalitsa, which is a woolly uh, Hungarian pig. And he's smaller, but they got a thick coat, very winter hardy, also uh, does very well on pasture. So we can put them out on the grass and he can just root and, uh, and keep his health and vigor without needing any, any extra grains. And their offspring, are hardy, they grow really well uh, without grain, and we, like I said, we just keep them on the orchards. So through the most of the growing season, they're not getting supplemental grain. They're being moved around in the in the uh, production orchards in the spring and in June, up until June, early July, with the drop of the early fruit and when we're hand thinning. And then uh, the apricots, when those blocks are done, we'll usually move the pigs into the apricots and let them clean up and they just love to eat the apricot pits and the whole apricot. In fact, they just crunch through those hard apricot pits like they were peanuts. Uh, we'll move them into the plums, and then later on we can move them into the summer apples at, you know, a few weeks after they've been harvested. So that's pretty much the concept with, uh, with the animals. And, uh, and I don't know where Buddy went. Yeah, I, I got some footage of them. Okay, uh, here on Hoke Orchard we use a lot of integrated pest management and we really try to use the state of the art in monitoring the different insect pests. So we time our insecticide sprays uh, to specific blocks and at the time of the th uh, when the insects go over threshold. Uh, right here are two of the traps that we are using this time of year. This is a codling moth trap and inside is a pheromone lure and then there's a sticky board that comes out and on this trap, there's a few other insects on there, but I can see a few codling moth are trapped on here. Our threshold is eight moths in one week. And then after we establish a threshold, then I'll use uh, a data logger, which records the temperatures. 
and at approximately 200 degree days then we will start to spray for the codling moth because because the uh, the pheromone trap is catching the moths in the adult breeding stage so we're they're putting out a pheromone attracting attracting the males so we we're counting male moths we know that they're breeding and then we know that 200 degrees after after breeding the eggs have been laid matured and will start to hatch so we try to spray just when the eggs are hatching out the other trap here this is uh, a plastic sphere and this catches apple maggot which uh, is also known as a railroad worm leaves little tracks in the apple we have a little vial here of perfume this is um, a five component lure of different essences that the adult apple maggot fly is attracted to and they will see this apple and lay on it attempting to ova position and then we can we can count this and we use five five to ten flies caught per week per trap as our action threshold now with the with the apple maggot flies when they're when they're getting stuck here that means they're ready to lay eggs they're laying eggs right now so if they're over threshold then we spray within a few days with the coddling moth we wait 200 degree days so if it's cool that could be two three weeks if it's really warm it could be five to ten days um, and then the other thing is we we do this in multiple locations throughout the farm our farm is broke down into about 15 different blocks 15 different individual orchards are at least that's how they're treated so right here is is one block right over there is another block and just below us uh, on the other side of this windbreak is is a, is another block so they're geographically close together but they do have different pressures from the insects and then every week we go through and keep track and uh, each line here is a different block and then this is reflects four weeks of trapping so I can quickly look and see if the population is rising or dropping on the codling moth and then the same on on the apple maggot so we have two pages worth of records here and our sprays are very dependent on this this morning Ian and I were going through what the trap counts were so he could decide which blocks to spray on the cider orchards and uh, and what products to spray on it and this is this is my sticky trap bucket we have extra traps extra tangle foot extra lures and we walk walk the entire orchard like i said once a week and clean the traps count and uh, and do a little scouting while we're on the walk now in this little block right here this is kind of a unique experiment that we're doing this is a high density uh, dwarf block so that you can see these trees are pretty small they're just coming into production there's one apple over there and one here and you can see some in the next row uh, but anyway this is a high density modern block but instead of a clean herbicide strip and like in an or uh, like in a conventional orchard or in some of our orchards we'll try to cultivate clean underneath we've selected some different herbs and plants to grow that are known to be uh, to thrive in a fungal dominated forest type soil and they are more deeper rooted as opposed to the grasses that are, are a thicker surface root which then pushes the apple roots down so the theory is that all these different plants in here you can see there's some comfrey and here's some yarrow um, a few different things flowering these are, are working with the trees and the trees are still growing fairly nicely we have about 14 inches of growth here on these young trees and again no no fertilizer is applied uh, teas are applied but uh, basically we're trying to work with the soil work with the microorganisms and develop a soil and a mix of microorganisms that are going to put the nutrients in the proper form for the trees to take up so instead of putting a bunch of compost on or synthetic fertilizers we're trying to create a soil ecology that is meant for the apple trees now something else you can probably see, probably see all the orange spots this is a, a variety of apple called crimson crisp 
that is resistant to apple scab, so I don't have to spray it for one of the major diseases in the Midwest. But a secondary disease that years ago was just, oh, you'd see a little bit of rust every four or five years. Now hits our orchards every year very heavily. So you can see there's enough damage to these leaves here that it's actually slowing down the growth a little bit and damaging the tree. So this is a variety that we're not planting anymore of. Uh, it's resistant to scab, but since our climate is getting warmer and wetter, diseases that were minor diseases in the past are becoming major diseases now. So we have other varieties that are resistant to both apple scab and cedar apple rust. So we'll be going more with those kinds of trees. The other thing you can see in this block is the orchard floor has a lot of different plants growing in it. So we're in, in August right now. And uh, you can see there's red clover, there's Queen Anne's lace, and if we got closer, you could probably see white clover and, and some other forbs all flowering right now. So our entire orchard is a, is a habitat for beneficial insects and, and for pollinators. But we have another plot that was planted just for pollinators, and we'll be going into that next. Okay, this is our, our pollinator plot. It's about a half acre in size, and this was part of a, of a project between the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems in Wisconsin and uh, the Xerxes Society. And they were experimenting with how well pollinator plots establish. And they had mostly unconventional farms. This organic plot here, uh, I did this all organically, so we didn't use Roundup, we just did some tilling. And there's about 20 different plants seeded in here. And the, the idea is that this blooms from the earliest part of the season up until fall. And they chose mostly native prairie type plants. There's some in here that I, that I don't think are native, but uh, it's growing just fantastic. And these cup plants make a great habitat for all kinds of beneficials. And as you're probably aware, cup plant has a has a deep, it's, a, it's an opposite leafed plant that fuses at the base and holds water in a natural cup. And I'll, I'll pour some water out here. I don't know if you can see it. But it hasn't rained in quite a few days, but all these cup plants have all kinds of little bird baths for every type of insect here. And for the first couple of years, these cup plants were about three or four feet tall. And in the last two years, they've been hitting eight, nine feet. And uh, everything in here is just growing really, really well. Uh, and the only thing we've added to it are compost teas, biodynamic compost teas. So the, uh, the soil organisms are adapting and changing from a grassy uh, prairie type to a uh, big thick multiple species so we must have a lot of different fungus and bacteria uh, in the soil here allowing these plants to grow to this size uh, hasn't been mowed or burned or anything it's about I think this is about the seventh season on it but yeah great great place for uh, our beneficial insects and our pollinators um, and of course we've got honeybees right here uh, they're loving it too you can see the bees all over in the flowers here. But this is kind of the center point for the pollinators on the, on the farm. And then we have small amounts of, of clovers and lower statured plants all throughout the orchards. The other thing we do in the orchards here is, we sp is when we mow, we mow every other row. And we don't, wait, we don't mow again until the mowed row starts to see, you start to see flowers. So there's always flowers and always nectar and, and feed for, the, for beneficial insects on this farm. Can I talk briefly about the deeper motivations for what I'm doing here? That's kind of a big question to start with as the first question. Um, trying to have a farm or a lifestyle that integrates most closely with nature is what's important to me. So having that connection to the land and the farm and trying to live a diversified lifestyle, eating the food that we have um, and enjoying the life that we want to have is the biggest things that I want to have on this farm is eating good food, having a wonderful place to live. Isn't that what most people want? Mm -hmm. I 
think that perennial agriculture is really a long-term commitment. Uh, what hardships have you had to overcome or what advice would you give others that are trying to get into it? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head about perennial agriculture being something that's a long-term commitment. Harry and I have been at this for over 30 years, and I think trying to have a vision of what you want your farm to be, realizing that there's gonna be ups and downs, and knowing that maybe the choices that you're making now, might, you might not see the impact of what those choices are for five or 10 years down the road, but also I would say don't delay making a decision. If you see something isn't working, stop doing it, do something else. I think working in partnership with community is important. I think trying to figure out um, similar goals though is a little tough. So on this farm we've convinced a lot of people that they don't really want to be a farmer. They might want to do part of the farm or they want to, might want to adapt part of it into their lifestyle. Um, We've had people who've come and spent a season on the farm to learn that maybe they want to have a town, quote unquote, job, but then their whole backyard becomes permaculture to be able to feed themselves because the most important things that they learned here was feeding yourself was important. So being able to be a farm that has the capacity to allow people to explore those options is pretty important. And being able to have the dialogue about what it is that they want to do is important as well because the scope and size of this farm is a little overwhelming. We have two daughters who probably will never farm, and part of the reason they say that is it'd be, it'd be pretty overwhelming to take over all of this. Well, all of this isn't just Harry and Jackie. It's Harry and Jackie and the people that work with us. So this piece of land that we have has a lot of capacity. The thing that it's missing in um, Ability is having enough people that want to manage or work with a farm this size. So I don't know if that kind of hits what you're looking for, but generally it's finding people with similar goals, similar values, and the willingness to work towards those goals and values and then make adjustments when things don't go quite the way you want them to go. And um, it, beyond the people aspect, um, what about the partnerships in nature, in, in with the animals, with <laughs> the, the local pollinators. How well, do you view, what's your view on working with nature? Well, I think that if you're going to have a good food system, you have to integrate and work with nature. So on this farm, you'll see lots of different biodiversity, whether it be the insects or the animals or the fruits or the vegetables, the crops that we grow, the natural areas that people, some people might look and see as being weeds. Um, those aren't necessarily weeds, they might be something that helps to work with our farm because like I said earlier, people want a good place to live and something good to eat. So if we provide that for them, if I'm a pig, I have a good place to live and I get lots of good fruit to eat. And they provide us an ecological service by helping to decrease the amount of pests and providing fertility to the farm. We have insects and pollinator plots because we want to increase our beneficial insects on the farm and they need a place to live and something good to eat. So if you look around the farm, you'll always find flowering plants because the insects need something to eat. So um, basically creating an environment where people, plants, animals, insects want to live, so a good place to live and good things to eat, that would create, in my mind, a good system. So I think that um, it's a pretty tough sell right now to think about how we want to change our agricultural system and what we want to do. Um, people are pretty far removed from the food that they eat. So how do we get people to understand where their food comes from and to put value in it is a philosophical question that will take much more than a minute to answer. So um, for me, the idea behind having a healthy ecosystem and a healthy environment to live in is pretty important. But for a lot of other people, the pace of what's going on and the political environment and arena makes it pretty tough for them to focus on that. They're focused outward. I think that farming is a piece of focusing inward. So you're not only cultivating the land that you're on and improving the land that you're on, you're also improving yourself. And people aren't taking the time right now to do that. They're taking the time to point their fingers at other people and say, that's the reason something's not working, rather than saying, what can I do to make an improvement? So we've got a long way to go on that. So. Being an example, lead by example, having opportunities for people to see the farm, having people dialogue, having field days for people to be able to come together um, are important. So 
I don't know if that really fits with what you're looking for, but it's a pretty tough sell right now. It does fit. Mm -hmm. That is good. All right, we'll get you off to work. <laughs> now, the most important part is that recording of that laugh. Most people that know me will say, well, it's not really a talk with Jackie until you get that giggle. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> that monarch fly right into your, into your view? I saw it. <laughs> yep, it was great. Okay. <laughs>